Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the Coco Engine devlog series. So in this episode, it's all about font rendering and we'll take a look at how it works, how you can import new fonts into the engine, how you can use those fonts in the engine and we'll take a look at some of the code I had to do to get that to work properly. We'll also take a look at some of the massive restructuring I've done to the engine's internals, specifically the asset management system. It was a mess before and now it is a lot better and works a lot more intuitively. So we'll take a look at all of that. First, let's see how the font rendering feature works. All right. So what do we have here? Well, you can see that we've got two objects in the world. These are game objects and they have a font render attached to them. Now, if I were to change the text in here, it would change the text up there just like you would expect. So if I changed it to something like this is a game, then just like you would expect, you can see the text change up there. And if you change the font size, it dynamically updates up and down. And if you wanted to change the font to something different, you could just drag in a new font, see how it looks and decide which one you want. Now let's talk about the quality because clearly these two have a quite a different quality. Now you can get a better quality if you generate an assigned distance field at a larger upscale resolution size. Right now these texts are rendering with font sized at 32 pixels by 32 pixels each. So each of these characters is only 32 pixels, but we get quite a good resolution. If you see me scale this up even higher, you can see that we're not getting very blurred pixels. You can see it looks a little weird around these corners and that's just an artifact of sign distance fields, but for the most part, you get a pretty good font look right here. Now let's add a new font just to see how this whole process works. Now this is the menu for now. I am probably gonna change the way this looks cause it's quite ugly, but I can select a font file. And so let's say I go into here and I select this uh, B-A-U-H-S. I think it's bold Arial is what that is. Now let's say I change, uh, so this is the font size. So this is like the actual font size that you will get the output rendered at. And then these are more advanced options, sort of. These two are sort of necessary. <laughs> this just tells you which glyph you want to start with. So zero, and then the glyph range end. So 123 gives me all the English alphabets. This is like lowercase z, and it gives me like the exclamation points and stuff. Then you have this padding variable, which I'm actually going to change to 16 and probably change that for the default as well. And you have this upscale resolution. Now, I'm going to do an upscale resolution of 128 because... I did it at 2K, so 2048 for this stencil buffer, and that took my computer an hour to generate. So <laughs> they take quite a bit to generate it, the larger the upscale resolution is. So when I hit this, it'll generate the font, and right now it launches like 15 threads on my computer because I have that many threads available. And then it just basically goes and generates this font as quickly as possible, which should only take a few seconds since we had it at a relatively small size. And you can see we get it there. And if I drag this into here, uh, we get the font. And the higher quality, so if I were to scale that 128 up higher, you wouldn't get this, uh, this sort of wiggly behavior right here. It would disappear a little bit more. But as you can see, it doesn't give you that much of a difference. This was at 2K. That took me an hour to generate this one. It took me like two seconds to generate this one. <laughs> okay, and this is the quality difference you get. If we were to scale this down to more like, you know, this is about the size I would have it in the actual game. And then we check the difference. It's pretty minimal. You know, like I think I'd be okay with this font looking like this. So that's why we have the option to change the upscale resolution. You know, you can go as low as you want or you can go as high as you want. I may uh, change the algorithm to run a bit faster for higher resolutions, but this is the basis for how it works, you know? Anyways, that is how the font rendering works. And there are a few different features you can change over here as well. You can change the text color, uh, filter through whichever colors you want over here. You can also change the Z index of it. So if I were to drag this down, I actually haven't tested this yet too. <laughs> and then if I bring this over here, you'll see it's behind that one. So that's good. And then if I go up, okay, yep. You can see that it goes up and down below the font. And this is based on the same Z indexing that I use for the batches here, you know? And right now I actually have a sprite render attached to this as well. And you can see if I bring that opacity up, we get a white square here. Uh, we can do one more cool thing too, which is say we want to actually see what the font texture atlas it generated looks like. Well, if I just drag this into, uh, well, actually I actually have to go to the texture browser first. And then I can drag this in and see this if I wanted to. And if I just scale this up and if we scale this so that we can actually see, 
This is the actual font atlas that we're using. You can see that it's the letters and they're just upside down. So yeah, this is the font atlas that it generates and then it just uses this to render the actual characters that we see on the screen. So really cool stuff. I'm excited with the direction this engine is going. I'm very close to a point where I'll be able to actually build a game. Now, I'm going to shut up and start working on fixing, first of all, making this look nicer, this importing tool, making this look way nicer, uh, fixing up some of the design around the engine overall, and then also cleaning up some of the code. So I will do that and I will update you guys once that is ready. So it has been almost two weeks since I recorded that last clip. Um, and not much has really changed in terms of UI. So if I were to add another new font, you'll see that this looks exactly the same as it did before. Never really did get around to fixing that up and making it look better. I did do some tweaks for like the settings window and stuff so that you can actually close these out now, the styles window and have them a fixed size. That's pretty nice. And I've also done fixing up some other bugs and stuff. But the main thing that I've worked on for these past two weeks is refactoring. I did not plan on doing this. I planned on actually just refactoring one class, but that one class went so well that I figured why not refactor my whole engine to match this new style. So basically I ditched OOP is what I'm trying to say. Instead of using object oriented programming in C++, I've basically gone for this namespace uh, struct. So like data oriented design, I guess is what you could call this. I am not designing my systems around objects. I'm designing it around data. And so now if something has data, so for example, this render system has no data, it's just a collection of functions because it doesn't need to hold any data. So instead of doing that, uh, if you do have to hold data or something, so like say you have a transform component, that's just gonna look like this instead. So if you have some data, it looks like data and that is it. There's nothing special about it. And then if I need to operate on that, then I create a namespace that goes along with that data and then you can use it to create. So if you have a custom construction you want it to go through, um, you can also use it to update, do different things with it, serialize, deserialize. So these don't really need to be with the data. Now you may be like, why do this? What's the point of separating the data from the logic? And there's no empirical evidence that I can tell you about why this is better, but it has made my code better <laughs> okay i had a ton of to do's where i was doing some ugly hacks and stuff in my engine throughout like these fifteen thousand lines of code and had no idea how to solve those but then these to do's just sort of magically disappeared as i was doing this because what ends up happening if you have object oriented programming is you have this object that now all of a sudden you have to send that object in order to get the functionality associated with the object but a lot of times you don't want that a lot of times, if you have like a scene class, all you want is some functions, right? You want somebody to just be able to say, hey, stop the scene. Here's the data. This is the actual scene that it is. Just stop it. And you want to be able to call that from anywhere. You don't care. And you just want to make sure that you don't accidentally mutate some global state or something. Hence the reason I'm passing it as a structure. And then if we look at that scene data.h, just to give you sort of an example, all this holds is like whether it's playing a registry for all the entities, JSON, which I should probably refactor that out because that doesn't even need to be there. Um, the scene camera and then this scene initializer, which is where I've kind of kept OOP for the time being, just because it does make a little bit more sense. And now you may be saying, well, what about inheritance, polymorphism, all these things that are supposed to be helpful? How can you do that if you're not using objects? Well, it's actually not that hard. So if we look at my application, I have this code where I used to use polymorphism to sort of uh, iterate through different systems that you had. And you could just add dynamic systems, which uh, inherited from a common system class and so on and so forth. It had update methods, all that. Well, I basically removed the polymorphism from that and it didn't really change that much in my code, okay? So instead of inheriting from a system and everything, now in the update loop, instead of iterating through this generic systems list, I just say, hey, uh, do the level editor system, update that, update the gizmo system. And then uh, I have this to do here to fix this, but uh, I am GUI. And then uh, if we're doing events, this was another place where I basically had that. We just call the scenes on event function. And then if we look in here, uh, we can see inside this update method as well. I just say update the physics, update the scripts, then update the camera. And then any other systems that I had in here, I would update right here. No need for polymorphism or anything like that. It's You just write a few extra lines of code to update each system as necessary instead of trying to abstract it into this thing that you don't really need to abstract it into. 
Now, there is some empirical evidence that this is better. So what are these numbers here? Well, these numbers are what my engine used to take up just to run in RAM and what it's taking now, okay? So 537 is closer to what it's taking right now. It hovers around these two. This was the lower end of what it would take up before. Now, 613 megabytes of RAM is a lot, and I am investigating why my engine is taking up that much RAM right now, but I have reduced it to this just by removing object-oriented programming. Now, why would that result in such a huge drop of RAM? Why would it drop so much like this? Well, the reason is because if we just needed a collection of functions and we just need to call some function in this namespace, but we didn't need an object associated with it, then that means that we had all of a sudden, if this was a class and this was some object, we would have to create some instance of this object just to get to this function. Over time, what happens is you get many of these objects and then all of a sudden you're eating up 100 megabytes of RAM without even realizing it because you just needed a function. Simply by removing that, that unnecessary burden, I have dropped my RAM by over 100 megabytes. And it's even more than that too because in the process of this, so another thing I did was I removed all shared pointers. I removed all unique pointers. I removed all... Well, I didn't have any weak pointers, but if I did, I would have removed those too. Instead of what I'm just using is raw pointers. Scary, right? So if I have something like a scene, I just use the straight up pointer like that. And I do have some uh, euphemisms to handle some other things like assets. I'll do a handle around that asset. So I'm not dealing with the raw pointer there just in case it gets dereferenced or something or uh, freed without me knowing it. But yeah, now what kind of benefit does that provide me if I get rid of all these shared pointers and stuff? Well, first of all, the reason you use shared pointers, why, why do we use shared pointers? Because memory management. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Memory management isn't that hard and finding memory leaks is pretty easy. So if I go into my render system, I came up with a little wrapper around the memory manager, malloc, and basically say I forget to free some memory. So if I use my memory manager, say I go ahead and I call malloc, or actually I think I call it alloc mem, which is my version. And you can see this takes a number of bytes. So let's say I uh, take a thousand bytes. So 1000 times size of char. Now I allocate this memory, but I never free it. Well, what's gonna happen? This is gonna be a memory leak, right? So this is gonna go and then cause a memory leak, horrible. How the heck do we find out about this? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Look at this. I get a warning after I close my application. And do you want to see what this says? It says application ended execution and did not free memory allocated at. Then it gives me the exact path to the file and it gives me the line number. Well, would you look at that? That says inside of render system.cpp line 54. Well, whoa, look at that. That's where I just made that memory allocation and did not free it. If I remember to free it, so let's say I say free memory. So free mem. And then I'm going to just get this void pointer. Uh, and then I say to free this. Well, what happens now? If we run this one more time, look at that. No warning because I freed that memory now. That's something that C++ people will not tell you. Is that it's really easy to check and make sure that you have freed all your memory. Now, how hard was it for me to implement this? Let's just take a look at memory.h so that you guys can see what it takes to implement this. Um, so these are the functions. In order to get the line number, I just created this macro, which basically wraps around the actual functions. So you can see that it expands to uh, Coco, namespace memory, namespace allocate, file, line. And these macros are kind of magic preprocessor directives in C++ that tell you the file and the line number that you're calling from. So basically, when I call malloc inside of render system.cpp, this expands to uh, this whole thing right here. And you can see that it includes the file and the line number because it knows that. And then uh, it calls this function allocate. And if we take a look here, basically what I'm doing is I'm keeping a std vector. So like a list, I keep a list of all of the memory allocations and this is only in debug mode. So like if I release this, then none of this overhead will be released with my engine because you don't want to be tracking memory like this when you're playing the game because the users don't care. It's just when you're developing that you care about this. So basically this keeps track of the file that allocated the line number that it allocated, how many references there are in memory, and the pointer to the actual memory address. And then we basically just keep a list of this. So you see I have this vector and it's called internal allocations. And then every time you allocate, I just add it. So first I check and see if we have it. 
And I do a few different checks. So I basically say, if we don't already have it, that's good. We'll just add it back with one reference. Then I say, if we do have it, because sometimes you can get the same memory address twice, then just increase the number of references. Otherwise, if there's still a reference around, we tried to do something kind of uh, that shouldn't be happening. So then I just log this error. And then I do the same thing here. Then at the end of my engine, uh, for like reallocating and for freeing memory. And then at the end, I basically just call this destroy method, which goes through all the internal allocations. It looks and sees if we have any internal allocations that still have a reference hanging around. So we have more than zero references. We log a warning and tell you exactly which file called it and which file, which line number that code called it on. So pretty simple. This is literally just 135 lines of code with some fluff because I have those hash if defs Coco debug and everything and then white space. So 100 lines of code and you can create a memory tracker that will detect pretty much any memory leaks. Not a big deal. So using std shared pointer and all that stuff saves me more because what happens when you use a shared pointer? Well, the whole reason you need things like shared pointers in C++ is because of new and delete. Okay, these two keywords. What happens when you call these? Well, when you call new, what happens is it calls the object's constructor. So this assumes that the object has some sort of constructor with some parameters and then does some uh, unique construction step. What this means is you can't just copy bytes around. Let me say that one more time. What this means is you can't just copy bytes around, right? Because if you have a class, say a string, and if this string class takes in a const char star a pointer, to some other memory. Then what you do when you construct this string is you might actually do some extra steps to make sure that this gets constructed correctly inside of this constructor. So what that means is I can't just go ahead and take whatever this structure looks like and just copy the bytes to a new location when I'm copying this object because I have to worry about calling this new. And I also have to worry about calling delete because there might be steps in delete. Well, what happens if we just use a struct that's trivially copyable. So all it contains is like some numbers and some floats and whatever other data you need. And we don't put any functions. We don't put any virtual tables. We don't put any of that stuff in there. What does this mean? Well, this means that how would you copy this? Well, it's trivially easy to copy this because it will always be the same layout in memory, right? It will always just be an int followed by a float, which the compiler and which C++ knows is just uh, this would be four bytes depending on the implementation. And this would also be four bytes, 32 bits each, right? So this means we can literally just copy the block of memory that this struct is occupying into some other place. And we have now copied whatever object this is. So if this is some object, we've just copied it just by copying the memory. And we don't have to worry about constructing it, doing any sort of weird things. And so this actually simplifies a lot of things. And it completely eliminates the need for using things like std shared pointer and weak pointers because the way that these operate is they will make sure to call the new and they will make sure to call the delete keyword as well. But what if you don't need that? Then it's a bit overkill, in my opinion. So anyways, this has been a kind of a long winded way to say <laughs> I've done like 15,000 lines of refactoring my engine. A lot of stuff has changed from the way I handled it before and the way I handle it now. I pretty much dropped OOP, saved some RAM, and I also saved a lot of headache from huge dependency hierarchies that don't make much sense. This devlog definitely went in a direction I did not expect. And I found out that there is no zero cost abstractions. People will tell you that shared pointer takes up nothing. It does take up something. You may not see it immediately, but it does take up something. And I just hope that I can sort of illustrate that. If you guys want to take a look at all the changes I made, there's quite a few of them. But if you go to my GitHub where this uh, engine is, and then you go to the font rendering branch, you can basically just go to the commits and starting uh, 11 days ago, you'll see that I started doing this whole refactor into namespace struct, refactor into namespace struct, all this stuff. And that's basically me refactoring all of these systems into a namespace and everything. So you can sort of see the process I took there. A lot of it is ugly. I'm still making this a little bit more stable, which is why I haven't merged this into the master branch yet. But anyways, this is it for this devlog. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In the next devlog, I hope to actually start building some games with this engine. So definitely making great progress. And I can't wait to actually start using this engine to make some cool things. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next one.